Good afternoon. I'm Robin Garrell, the president of the Graduate Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual event for alumni. A few weeks ago, I participated in a weekend workshop on spontaneous Chinese brush painting. It, it's completely different from Western style watercolor painting. You load a, a large brush with water and with as many as six colors in different places on the bristles. And the paper is thin and absorbent. And with a single gesture, you make a mark using just a small number of strokes. Your goal is to communicate the idea and the vitality of the thing you're painting, whether it's a bird or a flower or a tree. And this afternoon, you are the paper. In just a few broad strokes, I'd like to paint a picture of where the Graduate Center is and what I see as our trajectory. My goals are to help you learn a bit more about me as the new president, but also to set the table for today's conversation with three luminary thought leaders at the Graduate Center. I came to the Graduate Center just 10 months ago. I'm the product of public education, having spent my entire career doing research, teaching, and service at big public universities. I was drawn to the Graduate Center because of its mission, advancing knowledge in service of the public good, and the ways in which the Graduate Center and CUNY more broadly are woven into the fabric of New York City. Every day, our students, staff, faculty, and alumni like you show their commitment to helping our city, our diverse people, and our great institutions thrive. You know, I anticipated but embraced the challenge of packing up my Southern California life, schlepping across the country, and becoming a, a denizen of Manhattan. What I just didn't anticipate, of course, was being a member of a crazy club, college and university presidents who started their roles during a pandemic with their campus closed. The ordinary rhythm of meeting, greeting, and eating were non-existent. But as each of, you, each of you knows well, the Graduate Center is a creative can-do institution, and we figured it out. So I think back on our journey over the past 14 months, um, they can best be described uh, using the words of Bob Wise. He's a former governor of West Virginia. And the words are triage, transition, and transformation. The triage phase was largely accomplished under the leadership of interim president Jim Meiskins in the months before I arrived, uh, rapidly transitioning to remote teaching and learning, research and work in general, figuring out how to reconfigure our daily lives and routines, and, and doing our best to stay healthy and protect our loved ones. The transition phase uh, really was as we entered the fall semester and, semester and continues to the present. Uh, we've kept things going. Our success was made possible through optimism and very, very hard work. The Graduate Center was well poised. We had great capacity in the form of our Teaching and Learning Center, our Technology and Pedagogy Fellows. Um, these are just some examples. We had the expertise um, that people shared, and this supported our transition to remote instruction. We also have an incredible leadership team, and I want to especially commend our provost, Julia Wrigley, our vice president for institutional equity and human resources, Pinar Osgu, and our senior vice president for finance and administration, Brian Peterson. He also leads the team that's coordinating what we call our, our reactivation, the return to occupying the Graduate Center and the ASRC. The past year, as you can imagine, has been particularly challenging for our students who've strived to sustain their momentum in their courses, their research, and their teaching. We've been very gratified by the community's response to our request for help. We were able to provide tens of thousands of dollars in emergency funds and catalyst grants to help students make progress in their research and complete their degrees. And I wanna give special thanks to Peter Darrow, who chairs the Graduate Center Foundation Board for his leadership in that effort and to the many trustees and many donors who provided their generous support. So now we're taking steps to gradually increase occupancy at 365 Fifth Avenue and the ASRC. At this point, looking to fall, we expect to offer about two thirds of our fall classes either fully or partially in person. And even before then, we'll be opening up the library, spaces for people to work and so on. As challenging as it was, 
we've learned a lot over the past year. Our core mission and purpose remain unchanged, but we're not looking to necessarily return to doing everything exactly the way we did before. After all, the Graduate Center is a living thing. It's an ecosystem and we can transform. Our experience with triage and transition has opened up our thinking and given us experience in what's possible. What we did out of necessity actually has the potential to have lasting value and impact. For example, uh, we learned we could have much, much larger audiences for public events like this by hosting them online. We transcended the barriers of commuting and even time zones. And of course, we also missed mingling in person so as we look forward, we ask, why not do both? Uh, can we not only sustain our reach, but further broaden it by hosting events that can be experienced simultaneously in person and remotely and available online for an extended time? Many of our instructors implemented innovative new pedagogies that we found were more successful than traditional classroom methods. So we can keep doing those things and using technologies like HyFlex we can engage students from across CUNY, from all the campuses, and from universities throughout the world, knowing they don't have to spend hours just getting to us. In the experience of the pandemic and the countless incidents of racial injustice we've seen over the past year and long before, have served to heighten our awareness of inequities in our society, in people's safety, in their access to healthcare, and your access to technology and many more things. So how will these histories and experiences and new knowledge inform the research questions that we address at the Graduate Center and how we educate the next generation of leaders? So how are we preparing ourselves to pivot from transition to transformation? Since I arrived in August, I've been meeting with people virtually, uh, learning about their work, asking what barriers they face to doing the kinds of research, teaching, and mentoring they'd like to do. And so I'll mention just three outcomes of those conversations. First, across all areas of the administration, we're figuring out ways to make it just easier for people to do the work of the university. That involves reducing paperwork, automating systems, and so on. But a related goal is breaking down some of the silos, finding ways to connect the really great work that's going on in different academic programs and the centers so that they can be even stronger and work together more synergistically. A second initiative involves making better use of data to help shape the actions that will advance university goals. And among those most important goals are increasing student and faculty diversity, Support, supporting student success and earning their degrees, and increasing external funding for research and student-focused initiatives. And the third initiative that you're gonna hear more about from our panel this evening or afternoon involves helping students prepare for diverse careers. Can, can we do a better job at organizing and offering professional development and career services that will support our students in identifying and landing great jobs? Because for the city to recover, we need masters and PhD graduates everywhere as faculty and academic administration, nonprofits at Google and more. So, so my goal is to position the Graduate Center as a national leader in graduate education for the public good, attracting diverse students and faculty who are or who will become extraordinary humanistic leaders who are committed to addressing the challenges our society faces today. Racism, socioeconomic inequality, injustice, climate change, and so much more. So joining me today are three extraordinary CUNY faculty to share their unique perspectives on the Graduate Center and its place as a public university in an urban setting. Kathy Davidson is the founding director of the Futures Initiative at the Graduate Center and one of the most prominent scholars and innovators in education today. She's a distinguished professor in the Graduate Center's doctoral program in English and in the master's programs in digital humanities and data analysis and visualization. Before coming to CUNY, she taught at Duke University and served as Duke's and the nation's 
first a vice provost of interdisciplinary studies. The most recent of her many publications is the award-winning book, The New Education, How to Revolution Revolutionize Higher Education to Prepare Students for World in Flux. Kathy has just been honored with the 2021 award from the Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences. Next, Ann Kirshner is university professor at the City University of New York and a faculty fellow at the Futures Initiative. She has a broad and deep understanding of the CUNY system and public higher education, having served as Dean of the Macaulay Honors College and as special advisor to the Chancellor of CUNY. She's been a pioneer in digital technology and media and is the founding director of the Women and Technology and Entrepreneurship Initiative at CUNY and Cornell Tech. And is a valued member of both university and corporate boards and she teaches a seminar on the future of work and the policies we can develop to ensure an equitable future. And finally, Van Tran is an Associate Professor of Sociology and Deputy Director of the Center for Urban Research at the Graduate Center. He's an alumnus of CUNY, a graduate of both Hunter College and Hostos Community College. He earned his doctorate in Sociology and Social Policy at Harvard University. He's an immigration scholar and an urban sociologist. He studies the integration of immigrants and their children neighborhood gentrification, urban poverty, and social inequality. So please join me in welcoming these remarkable scholars. I'm looking forward to a stimulating conversation with them and with you. Uh, as we go along, I encourage uh, the audience to post questions in the Q&A feature. So I'm going to start off with a question for each of our panelists. And starting with you, Kathy, how would you describe graduate center students today? Um, who are they? How are they different from students that go other places? And how is their experience at the Graduate Center distinctive? Uh, and how does it prepare them for what's next? I'm gonna, going to have to warn you that I'm not unbiased here. I'm a, a unmitigated, unrepentant uh, booster of the Graduate Center and of CUNY in general. Uh, I'm from Chicago and kind of had a Chicago a uh, person's view of New York. And I must admit, I was disappointed when I came here because I thought every bridge and every tunnel coming into New York would say, you are entering the most expensive city in America, but your kid can get an education here. I think CUNY's a miracle. And our graduate students are hugely responsible for that miracle. Um, during the pandemic, the year of the pandemic, our students taught 50, our graduate students taught 5,200 classes. Um, almost 150,000 students. And they weren't just any students. These were students who at 2 a.m. might be on their bikes delivering essential goods and services to the city of New York. Low-income students um, who valiantly were the city's essential workers. Um, I believe that categorically your research changes, your idea of the role of higher education as a public good your commitment to doing the best teaching and the best research you possibly can changes. When you're sitting in a class of 40 students who might speak 40 different first languages, that's not unrealistic at CUNY, um, who you know are fighting, fighting um, to get an education, set, making huge sacrifices to getting an education. You can't be cynical here, I'm sorry. You can, be, you can do critique, that's our job, but you also know you can't end with critique. You have to build, you have to lead, for some, lead something. You have to offer a vision of a future because your students, the students you're teaching every day in your classes as a graduate student are fighting for that education. And what I've seen here, I've taught at community colleges, a huge state university and Ivy League school, and then I was at Duke for 25 years before I came here. And what I've seen here is a kind of passion for research that matters and research that will somehow have an impact on society, um, that will have an impact on how we think, how we know, how we feel, how we understand the world. And I'm convinced that's because of the intimate relationship our graduate students have with the students they teach. This isn't typical. Many elite universities won't allow graduate students um, to to teach to their undergraduates because of undergraduates who are going to be the donors, future donors. So you want them to have very famous professors teaching them. That's not true. And our students work so hard to be great teachers. Um, I, I think it's a kind of a miracle. I'm astonished again as a Chicagoan that New Yorkers don't seem to have an appreciation of how much 
CUNY has saved the city. Um, uh, every time someone delivers a pizza or whatever to my house, I always say, are you a CUNY student? And inevitably, um, they're working full time while they're going to school at CUNY. And uh, it's, it's humbling. It's humbling to see how hard our students fight for their education and humbling to see our graduate students who are right there getting their own research, becoming specialists, becoming experts at the highest level at the same time they're teaching our CUNY students. So it's, it's a remarkable system. I'm not gonna say anything negative. I'm sure there are negative things to say, but um, my heart is very full every time I think about CUNY and our students. Oh, thank you, um, So Ben, you've been engaged with CUNY through much of your student and faculty life. How would you describe the Graduate Center's place in the city? How, how is it distinctive and impactful and, well, necessary? Well, let me begin by saying I'm delighted Delighted to be here among all of you. Um, thank you, Robin, for organizing this panel. I have had the privilege of affiliating with CUNY for over 20 years, since my undergraduate days. And as I listened to Kathy, I remembered myself during those undergrad years when I was working in a hardware store on the Upper East Side of New York, 45 hours a week while trying to get my education at Hunter College. That's the type of students that we have. Um, but to come back to the broader theme for the panel, I'd like to speak about two uh, related topics. One is the place of the GC within the CUNY system and the place of the GC within New York City. The GC is a very, very special place and all of you know this given your involvement with the GC and with CUNY. It is in my mind, the crowd jewel of the CUNY system without any question. And its place and centrality within CUNY and within New York City has only increased and become more significant given the pandemic that we experienced over the last year. And that's the case I hope I can make today um, along with my, my colleagues in this panel. I remember the first time I came to the GC, I was overwhelmed by the lobby and the beautiful columns and architectural details from Hunter College. It felt like Wow, the GC is truly a place of deep and higher learning, of research and discovery, and everything was possible for me then as an undergraduate. And that sense of marvel um, in terms of where GC is and what GC can be is still here with me every day as I walk through our front door into our lobby. The GC often begins um, with a conversation I often have with prospective students. They often ask me, so what is the Graduate Center? Our name is a bit unusual in the kind of larger landscape of American education. And I said, it is because it's rather special as a place. And I tell them often that the Graduate Center stands for the Graduate School and University Center. The graduate school part is easy for them to grasp because it's the equivalent of grad school in arts and sciences anywhere else across the country. The university center is a mission, a vision that we have been working on and have great potential to deliver going forward. We were established to be the hub for the entire CUNY system. We are fortunate to be located right here in Midtown Manhattan, central to the city. And we have been and I think we'll continue to serve as that hub for faculty from across the CUNY system, for undergraduates and doctoral students from across the CUNY system. Kathy, Kathy spoke about how our students taught everywhere across the country, uh, across the city. That is the case. And in that teaching, our doctoral students are connected deeply to many, many communities across the city. And that brings me to the second point, which is the centrality of the GC within New York City. It is remarkable that the New York City area has an institution like the GC. And I think that um, we have great potential and in so many ways, um, as Robin pointed out, we are at a moment of transformation and very much so. And I'm hoping that we can transform as New York transforms and comes back from the pandemic. A bit of history. When I think about CUNY and GC and New York City, 1970s was the decade 
when CUNY grew significantly with the establishment of community colleges and four-year colleges, from Hostos to Beirut to York to CSI. 1970 was also a moment when New York was in a traumatic state of decline and urban decay. And yet we grew and met the needs of educating the immigrants and their children who came from all over the world. And in a nutshell, immigration saved New York City half a century ago. Today, we're at the exact same moment. People have been declaring that you know, New York City is dying, the doom and gloom are back. But of course, um, as New, York, uh, 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 New Yorkers, we are committed and we believe that the city will come back. But once again, in this moment of coming back, we have a great role to play in this process. And I would argue, and I'll stop after this final comment, and we can have a broader conversation later on, that key to this next stage is the university city partnership that we must forge and develop. Because we are, as Robin said, part of an ecosystem within New York City. And we need to bounce off each other to create a more inclusive, more just, and more equitable future. And I think that is the vision underlies a lot of the work that our students engage in and that our faculty engage in. And we are uniquely positioned compared to our other um, 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 competitors or uh, uh, peer institutions across the city, all of which are private universities. And we are the only, the only urban public university in New York City. And that I think speaks to our place in its future. Thank you so much, Van. Well, that's really a perfect segue to you, Anne. So, so what do you see as the role of the Graduate Center in the economic recovery of the city and the region? And uh, do research and other kinds of partnerships factor into that? So New York, New York is it, there must be a partnership calling. Um, so New York, <laughs> is a, New York is a city of, of change, you know, um, as, as Van was talking about uh, walking into the Graduate Center for the first time, um, I was remembering walking through the building um, only there wasn't a library there. It was B. Altman's um, and I was a kid growing up in New York City and uh, B. Altman's was a place that uh, actually <laughs> I couldn't afford to buy anything, but I loved walking through the way you would walk through a museum. Um, and when I actually first came to the Graduate Center uh, and I had an office on the third floor, actually it's the office that Kathy now uh, occupies. Um, I think I, I said to my, um, my then assistant that the last time I was in that corner of the building, I was there to buy a new bra. Sorry, uh, can I say that? Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, think about what, what that building was um, and then think about what that building is now. Um, and I, I, take, uh, I take heart from that because I remind myself that, um, that, that New York, you know, as a, as a creature, as a, uh, as a, as a living thing, um, is, is always subject to change. And uh, change is, is inescapable, unavoidable. The question is, how, how are you going to respond to it? Um, we are central to the city at 34th and, and 5th. Um, and, uh, and even though that is still a very quiet corner of New York, because Midtown is, is still coming back more slowly than other parts of the city, um, as Robin laid out, we really haven't missed a beat. Um, the, the Graduate Center was still vital to the life of the city this, you know, this whole, this whole time. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm not uh, cynical uh, at all, uh, to, to use Kathy's word. Um, I do worry sometimes um, that the city doesn't fully appreciate the importance to, uh, to it of, of CUNY and the, and the Graduate Center. And, um, and yet I think that presents us with an opportunity for kind of a reset moment. Um, the city itself is gonna go through a reset in, in so many areas. Um, and there's not a single sector of New York, whether it's theater or tech, 
um, or science or, um, or, or real estate or whatever it is where our students aren't getting um, fantastic training um, and doing research that, as Kathy noted, is not simply cutting edge, but research that's devoted to making the city and the country a, a, better, a better place. Um, so as we think about this reset, it's a moment to do what we do so well, um, only maybe do it in different ways. Um, what are the new credentials that students are going to need? We know, we know we're awfully good at master's and PhD programs, um, but what are, the, what are the new forms of credentials that might be possible? Um, we know how to teach virtually now. Um, where is that technology going to take us? both uh, as, as researchers, but also as, as teachers. What does this pedagogy mean for the, mean for the future? Um, and, uh, and I guess the area that uh, I have the most experience in, um, which is public-private partnerships, how do we think about the industry of New York and making sure that industry understands that the greatest source of talent they could ever have is right under their nose here at, at, uh, at CUNY and at the, at the Graduate Center. And there's a great role that all of you can have in helping us um, make sure that that message gets out there as, as loudly as, as possible. So, you know, if you, think of, if you think of the Graduate Center and CUNY as, um, as you know, maybe slightly uh, under the radar, not quite where we ought to be in uh, in the city understanding how important we are, this is a great moment for us to roar a little um, because the city's needs are so much more acute than they ever have been in, you know, probably for, for 30 years. Um, but also, you know, we've got such astonishing new leadership, bold new leadership uh, in Robin and, and her team that are really poised to take the Graduate Center to the, to the next level. So, I hope you have lots of questions for us in, uh, in how we're going to accomplish that next leap. Okay, thank, thank you, Anne. Well, so, so let's pivot from a couple of the points that are raised. I'll throw this open to, to the group. So, so how do you see our public-facing research portfolio evolving, um, recognizing that many of the issues that have been brought to the fore over the past several years, um, which I mentioned in the, in the prologue, and, and the strengths of scholarship that we have of course, in the humanities and the social sciences, but increasingly, of course, in the sciences as well. Uh, what is the Graduate Center position to do that would be highly impactful for the city, the region, and the nation? I, I could take one stab at it um, based on the work that I've been doing with our fabulous Department of Computer Science, um, and that is in the area of, of data science. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the key to great research in data science is huge data sets. And who's got the biggest data sets of all? Well, they're in, they're in government um, and they're in, they're in the private sector. Um, so there's a wonderful opportunity here for, the, um, for the, the computer scientists and the data scientists to partner with um, the city to do research on epidemiology and on, uh, on, on how we're going to recover um, through vaccinating the, the whole city, um, whether it's around healthcare or transportation. Um, there are just enormous things that, uh, that we can offer to the city and to the, and to the private sector. And one of the areas where the Graduate Center is really pioneering is in saying, Okay, well, again, we understand master's and PhD programs, but um, those require a commitment of, of time and resources that not, not everybody has. So what sort of new credentials um, might we create that could enable us to partner with uh, employers of some of the leading companies around the city and, um, and tap that diverse um, pool of talent that we have at, at CUNY um, knowing that they, uh, they juggle work, they juggle families, and they juggle their education. As Kathy was saying, um, they, are, they are the master jugglers, and they are just the kind of, of, uh, of hardworking, gritty, committed um, employers, employees that, uh, that, that uh, are, are most, are most um, desirable. 
you know, sometimes people say the, the millennials are, uh, are entitled. What have you done for me lately? CUNY students, graduate students at the Graduate Center are the unmillennials in that sense because they, <laughs> they show up and they will work harder than anybody else will. I love that, unmillennials. So, so maybe oh, yeah. on that because social science research is, is burgeoning, maybe there's even ways to, to connect that with, with the data science folks. Interdisciplinarity is, is the name of the game. Um, you know, outside of graduate school, you don't do anything by yourself. Everything no. is done as, as teamwork. And I think that's an area that we could actually uh, expand in how we prepare graduate students by getting them thinking about how to work across the disciplines uh, and, and partner. I just heard this fabulous lecture on, on quantum computing. And one of the points that they made is that it's a little bit of data science and a little bit of computer science, and it's a little bit of, of materials engineering and chemical. I mean, it just, there, there were so many fields that were coming together around quantum computing. And, and you know, that, that's, how, that's how life works outside of the university. And so I think the Graduate Center, because it houses so many of those areas under, under one roof, has a great opportunity. Well, if I could just add to what Anne started on, um, I think that the social sciences have a profound place to contribute. Um, at, the, at the core of what we do at the GC is knowledge creation and research. And we have such deep expertise on some of the most vexing social problems of our time, from immigration, intergroup relations, racial justice, and rising income and socioeconomic inequality and the possibility of creating more social mobility for those who are from more modest backgrounds. And our faculty are deeply engaged and the public programming that we've been doing bring that knowledge and that awareness to the public in an unbiased way. And I cannot emphasize enough the centrality of the unbiased nature of knowledge and information in a moment where much information can be misinformed um, can be mis can misinformed or can be distorted. And I think that really is our place, which is to be sure that the truth is being told and told in the more nuanced and complex way that it deserves to be told. So that's one way in which I can see this uh, moving forward. But the second is really coming back to you. Um, Anne spoke about the private university partnership and I would push for the public um, 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 city university partnership as well to complete this cycle of three kind of you know uh, pieces within this ecosystem, and that brings me to my final point, which is policy impact, um, informed policy that is based on actual research, from mm -hmm. housing affordability to homelessness mm -hmm. to what we call the innovation complex or the tech economy or the knowledge economy. How such, become, how such ecosystems work and how can we promote and cultivate innovation, which I think is at the core of a great university, but also at the very core of a great city. Mm. I would only just add to that, that one of the upsides, if, there, if we can say that, of the pandemic has been to see how much people are paying attention. We might not be as recognized as we should be. But uh, for example, I went to a program on race and racism uh, by scholars from the Graduate Center and other scholars as well. There were over 900 people who attended that online. If it had been in the Bill Kelly Center where they no would normally have it, I think that it's 75 people. So suddenly, nine, I mean, we pushed our technology to its capacity. So I think there really is a kind of a sense that not only are we in a very special place at a moment of crisis, which is also a moment of opportunity, but people are listening and we can grab that attention. And um, so it's a, it feels to me, we're in a kind of a liminal space that's uh, not just triage transition, but we really are on the verge of transformation. And I think all the parts, the parts are right there. Also, a decade ago, we didn't have Raj Chetty's incredible work on social mobility. So when people would talk about graduates of universities, they would always talk about how much somebody earned. Now we talk about the difference between 
family income coming into a university and how much somebody earns coming out. And eight of the 10 top universities in the country for social mobility are CUNY campuses. And again, that is so deeply part of what we do and so crucial to what we do. We study it, we do it, and we communicate it. That's kind of a cool, cool thing. And, and here we have alumni who are interested enough in what we are doing to be participating in this, taking time out and, and spending yet another hour on Zoom in order to think about this with us. I think it's, it's very moving. So, you know, the Futures Initiative started before the pandemic, really. Okay. And, um, but yet, yeah, it was incredibly helpful to our ability to transition. So as we think, looking ahead to how, you know, we're preparing uh, graduate students uh, for inclusive pedagogy and student success, and for many other things, how, how do we see um, the Futures in Initiative being shaped by what's happened over the past year and, and do we see new things ahead that we didn't imagine? Yeah, so um, we start, I came here in 2014 and the charge I had um, was to try to look at the ecosystem of CUNY and the Graduate Center and think about things that didn't exist. So there was no teaching and learning center then which seemed impossible. And so we helped create, um, sat on the board and helped design a teaching learning center, center which Thank you, Luke Walter and the amazing people, the Teaching Learning Center is one of the best in the country. And boy, were they there when we had to go online. On Twitter, every single day I learned, so, and this is my field, so I thought I knew things. And I was learning things every, every single day from our Teaching and Learning Center. Another thing was to have more partnerships between the faculty who taught at the Graduate Center and faculty who teach every day out in the campuses, at the two and four year campuses. So now in fact, um, there's a sort of spin-off grant from, that we won from the great and generous Mellon Foundation called Transformative Learning in the Humanities, where we will have 51 faculty teaching leaders from every one of the, literally we were able to draw people from every single one of the CUNY campuses, uh, together thinking about what kind of innovation works for specialized graduate training, for undergraduate training, for um, to your colleges and how transfer among all of those levels can be as seamlessly as possible. I'm, just, I'm very excited about that. Um, we also, uh, used, as part of our grant, had funds to bring in renowned speakers to talk to us all about cutting edge research. And we decided with the Mellon Foundation's blessing to instead use that money to allow CUNY faculty to talk about their research. And CUNY faculty put on between February and May put on 71 separate events that they hosted using their research, their students, and then sometimes friends and alumni. Those were attended by thousands of people. And it was again, very CUNY homegrown at a time when everyone was feeling battered and um, you know, by the pandemic, family members losing jobs, family members dying, all kinds of things were happening. And suddenly they were the, not only the stars, they were performing an incredible service to other people. And that to me, again, is so key to what we do, research, teaching, public service, policy, all of those things working together. I don't know what discipline most of those things were. I mean, we've been talking about things across disciplines. I think if you're talking about a pandemic, you're talking about health, uh, uh, inequality, economics, I mean, there's what wasn't, uh, architecture, um, how we occupy space together, um, ideology, false knowledge, propaganda, politics. I mean, there really was no area that didn't need wise considered expertise um, and really made clear how important it was to connect knowledge across, across our different units. So you know, many people view graduate education, I'm speaking now of the public at large, uh, particularly doctoral education as something that benefits individuals, but not the public. Um, why should taxpayers invest in doctoral education and how can our alumni, like the folks listening in here and, and our friends help communicate the importance of what we do? Um, and, you know, should they, uh, bring their friends to, to build our fan base? Uh, how, how can they help us get this message out? No vaccine without graduate education. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you know, the story, and I'm now forgetting his name, the Turkish immigrant to Germany, who in seventh, the equivalent of our seventh grade was told by his teacher 
that he should never he would never go on to college. He should go to vocational school. Another teacher said, no, 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 I think you're brilliant and made sure he went on to a college education. He's now one of the 10 richest people in Germany, but he also has given enormous amounts of free IP because of the he and his wife for the vaccine, the first version of the vaccine that was invented. I mean, that's a German story, but it's also a CUNY story of how advanced research changes lives for individuals, but also with massive impact and benefits to the society at large. I think it's pretty clear in the, in the sciences and in technology that American competitiveness depends at least in part on the creation of new knowledge and new knowledge happens in, uh, in, in, graduate, in graduate schools. I think it's less clear, uh, let's say in the, in the humanities um, where we've had if we, if we think that humanities doctoral education is about creating new tenure track faculty members, um, then there's, 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 something, there's something amiss because the, the, the lineup of how many jobs there are and how many people are, are coming out with, with doctoral education is, is mismatched. And I know CUNY does better than many other graduate schools in, in getting their students jobs. But my point, there's actually a positive uh, message in this, which is, um, it, one of two things has to happen, in, in my opinion. Either we have to produce fewer doctoral students, or we have to have a much more expansive view of what doctoral education in the humanities is, is all about. And that with a PhD in English, and I guess I'm, I'm the poster child for, for this, um, you can pretty much work wherever you want to and do whatever you want to because you know how to learn and you know how to put your education to, to good use as a communicator as a creative thinker, as a problem solver, and as a, as a collaborator. So CUNY, the Graduate Center has been a leader in rethinking what the role of the humanities PhD is going to be outside of traditional academic appointments um, through the a Mellon grant, um, which uh, has done fascinating, fabulous work in, uh, in preparing graduate students to think about uh, careers outside of the outside of the traditional academic uh, appointments. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we're on the right track, which is don't stop preparing graduate students um, for, for doctorates in the humanities, but think with new eyes, think with new creativity about what the social benefit of that might be. Yeah. I would just add that um, this distinction between public education and private investments it's a false dichotomy because mm -hmm. the fate and fortune of both the public and the private sectors are deeply intertwined. That would be my response for the broader kind of graduate education question. However, when it comes to CUNY and the GC, um, I argue that we need to invest in the GC and graduate education because the GC is special. It opens doors to those who otherwise would not have had a chance to get a doctoral education. And it opens our academy to more diverse voices and perspectives that are traditionally excluded and marginalized. And that is a public good that either should be funded by the city and the state and or it is public good that any private citizen should feel committed enough to foster and cultivate. And finally, when you look at our alumni um, and al alumni um, um, across the country, they pursue a range of very interesting career paths. So there's no one path for your life after your PhD. And that diversity is something that we want to celebrate and hopefully help our students um, uh, find their own voice and their own passion and their own path. So uh, a related question that came up, um, this is from Professor Starchevich, who asks about, um, you know, it's sort of easy to think about what you can do with data science, but coming back to what we were just talking about, uh, how the humanities can be seen as a rich resource and a benefit to the city. So career paths our students follow, ways you might maybe engage them and in internship experiences that advance the missions of those uh, nonprofits and public institutions. Any thoughts on that? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Van. Put you on the spot. 
No problem. Um, I would say that we have had a lot of very, very strong partnership with various, you know, local museums and nonprofits, um, you know, including obviously the New York Public Library. And that's really where the humanities are rather in demand because they can bring a very particular critical lens to the various exhibits and curations that are going on. One example is um, at the Met, for example, we're having a major conversation about how can art be more inclusive of the different communities across the city. And that really requires, again, diverse input from those who have the expertise, but also the connection to these various communities. And more fundamentally, I would argue that not everything is about the economics of it all, that there is a central place in our society for ethics and morality and the humanities more than the social sciences or the natural sciences provide that compass so that we can create not just successful graduates or alums, but also productive citizens that can participate in our democracy. And that again is a deeply humanistic perspective. So, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this because it has nothing to do with ethics and morality, um, but I'm probably the only PhD in English who ever worked at the National Football League, which I did for, <laughs> for, five, for five years. Now, why did the National Football League hire me? They didn't hire me because I knew a lot about football. Uh, in fact, my, my husband had to explain the game to me before I went for my first, <laughs> before I went for my first interview. But, but they hired me because, because I could think about familiar to them anyway, familiar things in new ways. I could, I could apply a fresh perspective to something that had actually gotten a, a, a tad stale from a, from a technology point of view um, and could bring people together and communicate what, what this new thing might be and why it would, why it would matter to them. So, so um, when we think about humanities PhDs in, in the world, we can think about them in the in the not for profits and in some of the logical adjacencies, whether it's you know museums or 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 um, you know publishing companies or or the like. Um, but we can also think about them pretty much anywhere they want they want to go because the role of synthesizing knowledge and communicating is something that every single field needs. So you know we could be we can be very imaginative about that. I, I, to build on what Anne just said, I know I was the only English PhD on the board of directors of the Mozilla Foundation, the people who make the Firefox browser. And what was fascinating to me is the a reason I was there is they were really thinking about the role of technology in education. And they wanted somebody who could understand that big perspective. The downside was these people who literally, literally invented the internet always were asking me about have you read this book? Have you read this book? They, they kept me very busy and on my toes wanting an English teacher's opinion about was this a good book or was this and what happened in this book? I mean, it, it was pretty funny. But I agree with, with what, what we're all saying here is these are, we're not in a time where knowledge can be, um, as one of my friends says, it's time to desegregate knowledge. It's time to think of knowledge, not in boxes, not as sequestered, but it's something that works together and we need, we need everything. We need to know and know how to work with people who have dramatically different experiences um, and skills than our own. Okay, so we, we're turning back to our students um, who you know, maybe as a, a, a aspiring English PhD would never imagine working for the National Football League. So <laughs> a question is, uh, or or picking up a data science certificate along the way so they could go work um, with LinkedIn, I don't know. So can you think a little bit about um, what the roles uh, do partners or more particularly our alumni have to play in helping our students learn about other career options they might not know about or that they might need guidance on how to pursue. So what could they do to help us out? There's, there's, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Van. Thank you. I, I, you know, you mentioned LinkedIn. Um, you know, every, every uh, GC alum should have um, CUNY and the GC on their, on their LinkedIn profile if they're on LinkedIn mm -hmm. so that they can be found by, um, by our graduate students. Um, because 
so the simplest thing, and it, it really is what Robin is saying, the simplest thing is for students to be able to see themselves in some of these new roles. And so making yourself visible to them and being open to being connected to them. And this can all be done through the desktop. It doesn't have to be done you know, through, through personal meetings, but just to be able to share what your, um, what your career path was, what your graduate, how, how, how should, what's the, what, are, what are the words for them to use to think about their graduate education, um, not through the lens of traditional academic rhetoric, but through the, through the words of, of whatever, um, whatever sector you've eventually joined. Sometimes it's actually an act of translation so that the words of what they did as graduate students sound right in the ears of a prospective employer. And that's something that you can be enormously helpful with. So mentoring is, uh, is, is probably number, number one. Um, number two to me would be, um, you know, open, open your, your, your workplace for internships and, and apprenticeships. It might be as simple as a, as a one day um, shadow or it might be um, sponsoring a, a graduate student for an internship at, uh, at, at your company. Um, these are the sort of, of really hands-on, um, mind-blowing um, uh, expeditions that students can, can take that would, that would uh, give them a new sense of what it is they could do with their graduate education. Okay. Okay. Um, what about, uh, you know, have you been involved in career panels? How do we uh, how do we invite folks in that we might not be thinking about um, to share their stories and and their paths of how they got from place A to place Q? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think I I think that idea of a degree being the beginning of your life, not the end, is. So so important and it, it writing a dissertation defending a dissertation feels so monumental but everybody also knows the anxiety of not knowing what comes later and having alumni who can help make that bridge whether on panels wow. being willing to offer internships to our graduate students um, even you know, being offered uh, willing to meet with them at their office and just talk about what they do in their days um, people who have different kinds of career paths outside of academia, that's just priceless. I mean, real, truly priceless. I have several students, graduate center students who are in different kinds of occupations. Um, Lisa Tellier-Ferry, who is one of our first Futures Initiative Fellows, um, who works on St. Catherine of Siena, I believe, one of the, one of the St. Catherines, uh, medieval Italian Catherine. Um, works for Digital Ocean, and she writes. Um, she is a program. She used to write program copy for them while she was a graduate student. Now she has many people working for her and doing that. And she still manages to to work on Renaissance Italian as well, and um, is interested. And often her programming manuals have little Renaissance paintings on the covers. So, and she does work. Actually, she I take that back. She does work on imagery and visualization too, and new technologies for. Uh, reproduction and, and visualization, as well as on intellectual copyright, uh, intellectual property and copyright. So those are the kinds of ways that knowledge are constantly being um, integrated and crossing disciplines. There's a question in the chat that I'm going to pose, but then build upon. Uh, the question relates to um, your recent news that some big companies, tech giants, even Apple, are dropping college degrees as, as requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what can we do as those who are committed to public education and CUNY do? But I think building on what was just said, how do we think of our master's and doctoral students you know, as a, that lifelong learning journey and uh, recognizing that there may be additional skills and credentials that you need to pick up along the way? So what does that look like for um, us in terms of mentoring our students and, and the programming we might use do going forward? You know, this is an area where CUNY is already both way ahead and not ahead in some ways, but we offer at, for undergraduates and especially at our community colleges, hundreds of different kinds of certifications uh, and ways of coming back and gaining certification by taking classes around. And I think that's a model for not an either or, but a both and for offering different possibilities for certifying different kinds of work, 
uh, including lifelong experiences that might count towards work. Uh, it's a huge issue that everybody in the country is working on now in higher education, how you transfer from community college to college to graduate school, but also how you transfer from life experiences to a degree if you want one, or how without a degree, you can still walk away from a university with something tangible um, that, that can serve um, in the job market, whatever that might be. And I think that that flexibility and ability to do both or should happen. It certainly happens at our School of Professional Studies and it should happen more frequently throughout CUNY. We have the, we have everything available to do that. So you, and you started with that notion and when you're talking about relationship with companies, the, the data science certificate is innovative. Um, what do you see in that sort of grad professional and doctoral plus space that we might be thinking about? Um, it, it's, I, I don't want to be too much Debbie Downer here, um, but I, I, I do think it's a, I do think it's a serious issue. Um, there are a number of companies that are that are dropping, uh, dropping the, uh, the the undergraduate requirement, um, and more importantly, when you look at um, at public sentiment, uh, there's uh, there's there's growing um, concern about the value of a college degree in the sense of whether it's worth it. Um, whatever worth it means. Um, and, you know, and I think we have to be honest here about how, um, you know, and I'm not talking about CUNY here or the Graduate Center, I'm talking about higher education as a sector. Um, you know, prices, prices went up, tuition costs went up and up and student debt went up and up. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, a, a sense of, uh, of a gulf between going to college and, and getting a career opened up where, you know, there, there is nothing anti-intellectual about students needing a job. There, there really is not. Oh, and so, yeah. um, and, and so um, by, by not investing as much in the career part of the equation of what students are going to do after college as, as much as we do in let's say admissions, or even in uh, in uh, in what happens to them while they're in in college, um, you know, I always feel like we have a dean of admissions. Why don't we have a dean of life after college? Um, because that that's mm -hmm. such an important mm -hmm. um, transition, particularly for first generation low income students who don't have the family network and don't have the career horizons that gives them a broad sense of, of what they're what they're going to do. So higher education has, has disinvested in, in career services. And this is not an area of particular strength for CUNY at the undergraduate level at all. Um, I think I'm understating that when, when I say that. Um, I think the Graduate Center has, has actually um, done yeoman's work in this, in this area. And in particular, the Publix Lab and that I alluded to before, I think has, has really been uh, part of a national conversation about how we how we do right by graduate students um, who invest their time and, and resources with us. So I think the answer lies in, um, in in better partnerships with our alums, with you out there who will tell the graduate students all the great things that can happen to them with their graduate education. Um, and in, in, um, in making that act of translation for them that I mentioned before, what, is, what does it mean to do a dissertation and, and how does that translate into what you might be able to do for, for an employer? Um, and, then, um, and then doing the hard work of partnering with companies to, um, to badger them <laughs> and drive home that they have this extraordinarily mature um, and well-prepared um, uh, talent pool for them you know, right, right under their nose. So I think there's I think there's um, there's a clear path for us, but I think we have to we have to invest in it and we have to um, we have to partner with you out there to make sure that um, that we do right by by our graduate students. So I agree with Anne about the practicality, but I just want to add a footnote um, to this, which is that universities and colleges are also places of exploration, intellectual exploration. And if it were not for CUNY, I wouldn't be where I am today as a sociologist because I did not even know what sociology was. Mm -hmm. It was the professors at Hunter College who introduced me to the sociological perspective and who encouraged me to go to grad school. 
So independent of Apple or Google or Facebook, whether or not they would require a credential for entry, I think there will always be a place for colleges as the first step of intellectual exposure. And especially as Anne pointed out, for those who came from first generation background who might not have had a chance to even understand what an education can do to you. Um, among our alum out there, I am certain that some of you came to the Grass Center from very, very uh, different backgrounds and might not have had pursue an English or a biology PhD if it were not for, again, the flexibility that we had um, in our institutional boundary back in the 1960s or 70s that allowed you to pursue what you uh, 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 were in love with. Um, and I think that, that that sense of discovery, I think, should always be at the center and the heart of any, uni any university, and I hope certainly at the GC. You know, you're, you're so right. And, and let's remember that the companies that are saying that they don't necessarily want students with a college degree, they want widgets in essence. They want, they want a student who can do, they want an employee who can do a certain task. It's, it's almost to pull, pull out a sports analogy. It's, it's like what happens with the leagues when they say, well, don't go to college, you know, just, just become a professional mm -hmm. ball player, you know, straight after, straight after high school. That, that time of exploration, of finding out mm. who you are as a student, as a learner, as a citizen, as a thinker, that is, that is like the best time you will ever spend. It's why if I had to do all over again, I would totally take a PhD in English <laughs> because I know it shaped my brain. I know it, it gave me, it gave me the, the curiosity and the ability to learn whatever I need to, whatever I need to learn. So, you know, so yeah, let, let's, um, I, you're so right, Van, let's, let's hold up that, um, that voyage of discovery as, um, as, you know, just critically important and one that should be available to all students, regardless of income, which is where the Graduate Center and CUNY really shine. Oh, that may be just a brilliant way to wrap up our, our uh, afternoon. I, I want to thank all the panelists and uh, remind the audience that um, after this event, we're going to be sending out just a very brief survey. You know, if you were intrigued with the idea of becoming a panelist or a mentor or a champion or figuring out how you can uh, help raise friends for CUNY and particularly the Graduate Center, uh, this would be a chance for you to learn more and uh, indicate how you might like to be engaged in ways small or large. So um, thank you all for coming today to, to connect or reconnect with the Graduate Center. Thank you for our wonderful panelists. I really look forward to uh, seeing you all in person and certainly again online. So thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye all. Bye everybody. <laughs>